Right, right. <laughs> and it will be live in 10 seconds. And then I have just a couple of sentences of the housekeeping. And uh, OK, great. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, first talk in our preclinical track se se session. <laughs> In this uh, presentation, Jeff Woodhead um, will walk us through the use of quantitative systems to toxicology models to evaluate the calcitonin gene-related peptide receptor antagonist. Um, before I um, give the floor to him and um, let him go ahead with the presentation, there is a couple of housekeeping remark remarks. Uh, we take your privacy seriously by attending this event or participating in the Q&A session. You are allowing us to contact you for the follow-up. And you may ask questions via the Q&A tab on your dashboard and any time during the presentation. If you need any technical assistance, please use the chat tab to ask questions. Okay, Jeff, go ahead. The floor is yours. Good. Thank you, Viera, and well, welcome to uh, to the uh, the conference and to this talk today, which is about advancing. It's a heck of a, a heck of a title, but we're uh, I'll just say it's about uh, uh, CGRP receptor antagonist compounds for for migraine treatment and how Billysim was used in uh, advancing some of those those compounds compared to a rather high profile failure at the beginning of the, that uh, that class in Telcajapan. So, um, as many of you all are likely aware, uh, uh, this is going to be a talk about quantitative systems toxicology. Uh, the idea here being that we're, we would be integrating the ex, uh, estimates of exposure from PPK modeling uh, via Gastro Plus, uh, our understanding of the relevant biochemistry, in, in this case of the liver, but uh, you know, we have a, our kidney platform as well. And the uh, the specific drugs interactions with particular toxicity me mechanisms that we measure in vitro, and we combine all those together into our Dilysim software, and that gives us predictions of, uh, of toxicity that, uh, in, in this case, turned out to be pretty good. So, um, within Dilysim specifically, that means we take in several different types of, of data. First, and uh, uh, Foremost is the in vitro mechanistic DILI data. Uh, that involves a bunch of different uh, uh, in vitro assays that we've fashioned into the uh, DILI SIM input panel. Uh, that is generally assays focused on measuring oxidative stress within a cell, uh, mitochondrial toxicity using the, uh, the Seahorse uh, oxygen XF analyzer. Uh, bile acid transporter inhibition assays. Those are usually vesicle assays with BSEP, MRP3, MRP4, NTCP. Uh, we also look at bilirubin transport and metabolism uh, frequently as well, but we won't talk about that really today. But the, uh, the, the first three for sure, oxidative stress, mitotox, bile acids, we talk about, we'll, we'll talk about those. Um, then we take the, uh, the estimates of exposure from Gastro Plus PPK modeling, uh, uh, and of course, you know, y'all are here. Y'all know what goes into Gastro Plus, whether it's uh, uh, something as simple as the structure, or something beyond that, to where we have clinical PK data, uh, in vitro microsomal data, etc. Um, further, you know, if there's any clinical data, for example, we know the dosing protocols, we know the, uh, the, the patient types, whether it's normal healthy volunteers or a particular disease state uh, and so on. And then we, uh, that of course turn, gets uh, all plugged into our software. Uh, we spit out a prediction of, uh, of DILI risk, uh, mechanistic uh, understanding of what's going on if there is a, a DILI signal from, from the software and potentially able to characterize which patients might be more at risk for, for DILI. Uh, so, of course, as you, know, you might imagine, this has a bunch of different applications throughout the drug development pipeline from preclinical, whether it's exploring mechanisms, ranking novel drug candidates and uh, extrapolating from you know, a rat, uh, you know, see if it, say, I saw nothing in the rat, will I see something in the human? I saw something in the rat, will I see something in the human? 
uh, to all the way to the first in human clinical trials where you can take a look at uh, dose optimization, uh, take a look at uh, whether some of these little signals we're seeing, could that be a problem? Could we mitigate those by going lower in the dose? What's going on with these, uh, these trials? And then up to simulating full-on clinical trials uh, and trying to, to, to analyze what, what could potentially go on and who might be more at risk for, for that particular uh, liver signal. Uh, this work today on the CGRP uh, compounds is, is going to focus a little bit on the preclinical where it's, it's going to focus on ranking some, some candidates for DILI, DILI potential and then understanding kind of a little bit of dose response, whether there's a little bit of risk and whether that is going to outweigh the potential benefit of the drug. Um, at this point, we have a poll question. Um, so is, is the poll up? I can't see it. <laughs> Um, should be up. Um, the admin should be able to see the poll. Um, we'll give okay, you great. about 20 25 seconds to answer the questions. Uh, feel free to vote. Have you seen or heard any advertisements for Nurtec or Ubrelvi recently? We'll wait a few more seconds. Um, Okay, let's see how many of you are watching the commercials. <laughs> and uh, it's about 67% um, of uh, you responded that no, you have not seen hmm. any advertisements. So I guess we will hear all of the news from Jeff. Yeah, interesting. I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed with y'all's ability to avoid drug advertisements because I, I certainly see the NERTAC ads at least almost daily <laughs> at this point. Uh, whether it's online or, or somewhere. And well, this is kind of the, uh, a little bit of the origin story of uh, Nurtec, whose uh, molecule name is Remedjapant, and Ubrelvi is Ubrojapant. Um, we'll focus a little bit more on Remedjapant uh, for, for, this, for this particular talk. We'll, we'll, we'll bring Ubro in at the end again. Uh, and so these compounds are called calcitonin gene-related peptide receptor antagonists, or I, I generally just refer to them as the CGRP compounds. Uh, that, uh, that might annoy our client a little bit, uh, but it's, it's less of a mouthful. The, the thing about this class is that there were two rather high-profile failures in, uh, uh, in this class at the very beginning. Uh, I believe it was Merck who, uh, who formulated a couple of these compounds. Telcadjapan and MK3207 were the first ones, and both of them showed pretty substantial liver signals in humans. Telcadjapan, in fact, got all the way to a phase three and showed some liver signals that, uh, and a couple of severe liver signals that ended up tanking the compound. So now you have these four next-in-class compounds, Ubrojapant, Remedjapant, Atojapant, and Zavedjapant. And this is a pretty promising class in terms of efficacy. They're, they're, they've, they've shown some really great efficacy in their limited clinical trials for at least for Telcadjapan and MK3207. These four compounds could really be blockbuster valuable drugs, but you have these prominent failures for uh, uh, due to liver injury first in class and uh, you know, now People are a little bit frightened of the class, so we need to be able to tell whether any of these compounds are going to have the same liver liabilities that the, the first-in-class compounds had. So what we, uh, um, we had a, a client come to us and ask us to, uh, to analyze a couple of these compounds. Uh, the, this was undertaken uh, some time ago, so... None of the phase three clinical trials have been uh, reported for any of these compounds yet. Uh, they were all still fairly early in development. And so those next in class uh, representations would be essentially purely predictive for, uh, uh, for this. It would be based in, uh, almost entirely on either very, very early clinical data or in some cases, pure IVIV. Uh, what they wanted us to do was replicate what we saw for Telcadjapan. And then uh, determine whether the, uh, the, the 
their compounds, Remegipan and Zavegipan, would be toxic or non-toxic. Uh, in the case of Remegipan, they had gone through a phase one, so we had some clinical exposure data. Uh, Zavegipan had not been in humans yet, so that was, uh, it was entirely IVIV at this point. Uh, they also wanted us to take a look at a couple of competitor compounds, Ubrojapan and Atojapan. Of course, because they're competitor compounds and their PK data hadn't been published yet at that point, uh, we had absolutely nothing to go on <laughs> with those two compounds. So the entire representation uh, from, from PK to uh, through was based on IVIV. So, so that's a, a, a purely preclinical to, uh, to, to clinical, um, no, not even preclinical. We didn't have any rat data or anything, Did totally in vitro data. Uh, so how do we go through all of this? So data, the, uh, I showed you the data slide earlier, uh, gathering up those uh, in vitro data sets we were able to to get all of the compounds they they bought the competitor compounds gave us their compounds they'll catch pants fairly well available and we sent those off we get, got our mechanistic input panel for oxidative stress for mitochondrial toxicity for bile acid transporter inhibition got us a, a nice full in vitro mechanistic toxicity data set for all of those five compounds in terms of the PBPK, there, there's some differences. Uh, Telcadjapan was, was well published before it failed. So there's a, a pretty good amount of, uh, of, of internal or of external uh, data there. So we didn't really have to worry about a lot of extrapolation with Telcadjapan. We could pretty much uh, represent it straight out of the literature and, and do a pretty good job with it. Uh, Rumet Japan, of course, there was the internal clinical PK data available, uh, not publicly available, but the client made it available to us and we were able to build a PK model for Rumet Japan. Uh, for Zaved Japan, uh, Ato Japan, New Bro Japan, we essentially just took it out of, straight out of AdMet Predictor, <laughs> uh, plug it into Gastro Plus and uh, see what it spits out. With Zaved Japan, we were able to tweak it a little bit based on some of the uh, the client's internal animal data. Uh, they also wanted to, to do tuvis and um, intranasal dosing. So uh, we were able to kind of tweak things so that it may be represented intranasal dosing uh, and, and what they expected to see for it. Uh, Ato Japan, Nubro Japan, as I mentioned earlier, purely AdNet predictor straight out of the box. Uh, so then, you know, we plugged it into DillySim. We looked at, you know, used our mechanistic data, we used our PK data, we wanted to see exactly how things turned out. So the first question was, can we represent Telcadjapan? Uh, we looked at Telcadjapan and we saw a toxic compound. Uh, there, you'll see a, a high ETCI thing here and, there, and uh, there'll be a couple of results here. Uh, talk a little bit about that. The, uh, there's actually some of the, the ETC data gave us two different representations of Telcadjapan because the, the, the data were a little bit uh, ambiguous coming out of the in vitro assay, but interestingly enough, both of them really predicted tox. So b both of them, you, in either particular case, whichever one you wanted to believe about Telcadjapan, uh, we were able to predict the, uh, the, the toxicity through, uh, um, through DillySim. So that was, that was good. Uh, we were able to, uh, to to do that, and we're now we're now in the the space of being believable for uh, for this class of compounds, <laughs> uh, and we wanted to look at what the rest of them were going to do. So, uh, as you can see here from the uh, the simulated Edish plots, uh, all of those looked pretty safe. <laughs> um, Remedjapant had a couple during some uh, extreme dosing cases that inched over into some uh, some ALT elevations, but Nothing that was particularly concerning, uh, for sure. There wasn't going to be any uh, any severe cases in uh, 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 in our simulations. Uh, Zavegipan showed almost nothing. Uh, Atojapan and Ubrojapan, for at the predicted clinical doses, very little was going on, uh, and there would be decent substantial uh, decent safety margin with each of those. Um, in fact, you can go into a uh, uh, the the actual dig into the actual numbers here, uh, you can see that the uh, the uh, 
observed ALT elevations in the clinic. There's 5% at the lower dose and 8% at the higher dose. Uh, we have the a um, little bit of an over prediction with the higher ETC, uh, maybe a little bit of an under prediction at the lower ETC, but you know, this kind of bookends where you know, you're still predicting something with telcagepan. Uh, you could see with remedjapan the, uh, the relative safety at the beginning of the, uh, the, those clinical doses. And with Zavegepan, you could uh, jack it all the way up to 100 times the clinical dose and see nothing. <laughs> With Atojapant and Nubrojapant, you couldn't pull it up maybe that high, but uh, you still had a five to 10-fold safety margin there. Uh, and you could also see some pretty substantial mechanistic differences uh, between, the, uh, between the two as well. So what that told us was, well, despite the fact that Telcadjapant was, was such a high-profile failure, all of those next-in-class compounds honestly looked pretty good to us. Uh, you, you could go forward with a clinical trial and expect to, to come out if our simulations were correct, come out pretty good. Uh, so Ubrojapant, Remedjapant, Atojapant, and Zavegepant all looked looked uh, looked good to us. So, you know, fast forward a couple of years, we uh, we did this work. We uh, um, you know, maintain remained in touch with our with our clients on this side, uh, and it turns out that. Uh, Ubrojapant and Remedjapant both are currently on the market uh, for uh, um, received FDA approval without a black box warning for hepatotoxicity, which is, uh, um, I think, honestly surprised a lot of people who weren't familiar with the modeling because the early in class compounds get hepatotoxicity, the, the, the box often it just kind of ends up on <laughs> the uh, on the label for, uh, for next in class compounds. But you looked at the, the the FDA looked at those two compounds, looked at the the, the clinical data, and said, "Well, uh, I think these are pretty safe." And very very recently, Atojapant just made it through uh, through FDA approval as well. Uh, Zavegepant is 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 currently trailing in clinical development, but there's a very good clinical trial uh, reported, no hepatotoxicity observed thus far, just as we predicted. So this this makes us look pretty good, right? We uh, we we made these pure predictions uh, long before any of these uh, these data came out. These four compounds would be safe, and it's turning out that they're all pretty safe. So there's a there's a footnote here, which is that this isn't the first time we modeled Telcadjapan and Ubrojapan. Uh, we have, in fact, have published with a different uh, um, client with with Allergan, whose uh, compound Ubrojapan is. Uh, they they were recently, I believe, purchased by AbV. So uh, uh, they're being the current marketers of Ubrojapan, uh, and I believe it's a Tojapan. Weirdly, um, the uh, but we looked at Ubrojapan and Telcadjapan for them. Uh, and also predicted that Telcadjapant was a uh, was a likely to be toxic compound. Uh, we looked at MK3207 for them as well, the other high profile failure. We predicted its uh, liver toxicity. And also looking at Ubrojapant for them, uh, none of the dosing schemes that they gave us uh, suggested there was going to be any potential liver issues. So. That ended up being uh, being interesting because you looked at this project. We, uh, um, oops, I think I switched these two uh, uh, <laughs> labels here. This is uh, this is the previous project here. This is the published data. Uh, the MK thirty two oh seven Telcad Japan New Road Japan. If you look at the similarities here, uh, we we predicted fairly similar frequencies of toxicity for Telcad Japan. You know, given the alternate ETC uh, inhibition equation and Delcadjapant in the previous project. And Ubrojapant for, for sure at the clinical dose, we predicted nothing, you know, total safety here. We predicted total safety in, uh, in the current work. So what that suggests is that you know, even though we did these with two completely different data sets, um, we actually had PK data, internal PK data for Ubrojapant that we used here, but we used uh, uh, Gastro Plus IV IVE out of the box in the, the current project. So two different data sets, two different ways of making the PK model, it led to the same place. Uh, Telcadjapant was still determined to be predicted to be toxic. Ubojapant was still predicted correctly to be not toxic. 
Uh, and it demonstrates a little bit of the, uh, the robustness of the Dilly Sim approach that uh, using two completely different data sets for the same compound, we got to the same place. Uh, and now I think it's time for a poll question. Okay, so in this second poll, we'll see how well you were paying attention to Jeff's talk. Uh, <laughs> how many uh, CGRP receptor antagonists has Dilysim represented? And we'll give you a few seconds to, about 20 seconds to think about this. And... Okay, we'll wait about five more seconds. Mm -hmm. And hopefully all of you managed to submit your, um, your answers. And uh, let's see. Oh, it's pretty even split. We've got <laughs> nearly 30%, four, nearly 30%, five, and the same amount. Honestly, I've lost count. So, um, Jeff, um, as a referee, how many was it? Well, I threw you all a curveball there because there were five in this particular project that I just presented. But because we did MK3207 in the previous project, that makes six. So I have six CGRP uh, receptor antagonist compounds, all predicted correctly, two toxic, four safe. So if uh, we were giving prices, we would have one winner. There was one one person who voted six. <laughs> one person voted six. All right, congratulations, whoever you are. Uh, <laughs> um, so the executive summary here: we uh, correctly represented the observed toxicity to Japan. We correctly predicted the safety of the uh, the four next in class compounds compared to telcadjapan. Uh, again, all of those pure predictions. We didn't have the clinical data for comparison at the time, uh, and uh, came up with similar results despite two very different data sets and PVPK model sources uh, in uh, the cases of telcadjapan and Nubro Japan. Uh, and that, that kind of demonstrates that uh, the Stilisim approach is robust, it's predictive, uh, and it's, it's good for, for ranking compounds and, uh, in this sort of way. So I can now open up the floor for some questions. Okay, thank you, Jeff. And we do have a few questions that came in. We do have five minutes to answer them. So um, right. first question, did you use the same input data for both sponsors or different data sets? Different data sets. Uh, we sent uh, uh, sent them both off to uh, to, to Cipratex and to, to Solvo, our, our in vitro providers, separately. So um, you know they they came back with two different data sets for Telcad Japan, two different data sets for Ubro Japan. They weren't simultaneous either, right? So you know there there's uh, there's one this uh, sent out and came back, and then another one we sent out and came back and then used those each particular one for its particular project. Right? So. A good question. The other one, it's more of a comment. I'm not sure if you will be able to navigate back to that slide to maybe provide more explanation, but um, mm -hmm. it was a bit hard to see what were the um, y and x axis on the slide where the toxicity prediction was qualified for all countries. Ah, okay. Um, well, so so for for folks who uh, who aren't necessarily uh, in the liver tox space 24 7 you may not recognize these plots these are called edish plots and they're they're uh pretty uh um common in uh in terms of what the fda looks for uh for uh, evaluating whether or not a compound is is, is potentially hepatotoxic the x-axis here is a uh, fold increase over the upper limit of normal of uh alanine amino transferase or alt uh, the, uh, the Y axis is increase in peak bilirubin over the upper limit of normal. Uh, the, uh, the body, you want to be in this bottom left quadrant. That's where everyone is, is within their normal range and everyone is, is safe. Um, when you cross into this, uh, th this right quadrant here, this vertical line is at threefold the upper limit of normal for ALT. The horizontal line is at twofold the upper limit of normal for, uh, for Billy. Uh, you cross over into this right quadrant here. It's the mm, maybe dangerous, but maybe not range. 
if you're up at this top right quadrant, that's the highest law range. That means you're almost certainly going to get some uh, some people progressing to fulminant liver failure uh, if you you get too uh, <laughs> uh, too far into dosing with that particular compound. You see people up in the highest law range. Uh, that drug is not getting approved. Uh, drugs will get approved with a couple of individuals in this bottom right quadrant sometimes, but uh, the FDA will kind of side eye you a little bit. Uh, everyone's in this bottom left uh, quadrant, everyone's happy. Uh, and as you can see for these four compounds, almost everyone's in that bottom left compound uh, quadrant. Even we push the dosing really high, really, uh, uh, really far with remedipan. Um, you don't really see too much poking over that line. So uh, that's the explanation there for those, uh, those plots. An excellent question. Thank you. And I think we do have time for one more question. Um, did you predict the liver concentration by incorporating transporter data in the model? That's a good question. It's been a while since I've built the <laughs> PPK models for these. Uh, the So for Ato Japan, Ubro Japan, and Zaved Japan, uh, we, we did not use transporter data because we didn't have any. We just pulled whatever the, the suggestion was out of uh, Admet Predictor. Uh, with Telcajapan and Remedjapan, I'm reasonably certain both of those use the perfusion limited model with partition coefficients, and we didn't really look at transporters all that much. Though we both have relatively high partition coefficients. Telcajapan's is stratospheric, and uh, Remedjapan's is around eight or so. I think Telcajapan's was in the 16 range, <laughs> uh, but both of those used partitioning uh, rather than. Uh, transporters to, to drive the liver concentrations off of. Okay, thank you, Jeff. And thank you all for joining us for this uh, session. This webinar has been recorded for playback and will be available on our website and YouTube channel. This concludes the session. Please head over to the lobby for the next presentation. Thank you all.